Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another thing where I talk about things. Today, I would like to talk about the economics of love. And, uh, and appropriate in the theme of the economics of love is I finally put up this poster that Petterup gave me. It's a little damaged, I don't know if you can see that on the, uh, on the camera. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's the Derpy family photo, <laughs> which, uh, which I kind of adore. It's like, a uh, Derpy's dad, arm's length from the mom, mom is kind of leaning away. Uh, Derpy with her chin up, you know, trying to be good, trying to take a good picture. Uh, not a single smile on the photograph. It's a, uh, it's it's so amusingly sad. Ponies are so cute. They're so great when they're unhappy. Um, yeah. But anyway, though. So uh, yes. On that note, what actually what actually encouraged me to uh, get thinking about this was uh, was a while ago I split up with my fiance. I mentioned this uh, previously, but. Uh, you know, after I did so, you go through that you go through that period of grief and self doubt, where you say to yourself, like, 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 uh, I was I was drinking like every night, and then I would get like pass out drunk, and then wake up the next morning with this terrible hangover. Like I was looking over photos and like old photos. You know, you have all these memories, and you're just like, oh god, this was the big mistake. This was it. This was gonna be the big mistake of my life. I don't know. I, I should. I need to go back. I need to apologize. I need to get back into this. this. And uh, and so yes, yeah, so you have all these terrible doubts. But a few weeks after the split. Uh, I, I notified my fiance. Well, I sent her an email, and uh, when we split up, it was kind of weirdly. It was like weirdly amicable. Like it was like uh, you know you're a great person. I'm sure you'll do well. Everything's gonna be great. By the way, I'm gonna block you on Skype and unfriend you on Facebook. I'm gonna stop following you on Tumblr. Tumblr. And, uh, and these other things that sound like it was a really sort of hostile breakup. Like, I remember talking to my family about it, and they're like, oh, so you're still gonna stay in contact? And I was like, well, I mean, I, she pretty much cut off all avenues of communication, so no? And they were like, oh, she sounds mad. And I was like, yeah, but the, the split was fairly polite. Um, so anyway, though, uh, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure she was mad. I sent her an email, though. I noticed that through all of that, she didn't mention what she was gonna do with the engagement ring. So I sent her an email uh, a few weeks after the split, and I asked her, like, what are you going to do with the email? And in my head, I knew she was going to sell it, because she probably might have mentioned it. Uh, it probably would have come up right away, one of the first things to think about, like, what do you do with the engagement ring after you split up with your fiancé? She didn't mention it when we split up. So sure enough, she sent me an email back, and she goes, I'm trying my damnedest to sell it. Um, you know, and then she gave me this whole moral ring and roll for like, uh, you know, y y you inflicted upon me mental anguish and uh, my needs are greater than yours and da 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 da. And uh, when I found out that she was going to try to sell the thing, like if you think about an engagement ring and uh, I, uh, like they're worthless. I mean, like essentially they're worthless. You buy them and they cost you like, you know, thousands of dollars depending on what you buy. I can't remember how much the one that I bought her cost. It was like a probably more than it was it was over a thousand dollars at least but the real value of an engagement ring is virtually worthless if you try to resell one of those things a lot of places won't take it and if you go to some place that will take it usually you know you'd be lucky to get 10 percent of what you paid for it so i mean like you you can't sell them i wouldn't be surprised if she was like seeking anywhere from like a hundred to three hundred dollars out of the thing it's, it's just a huge ripoff trying to sell the deal so there was it was incredibly frustrating but it was also very predictable, and in a lot of, in a very profound way, uh, it made me feel better when I found out that she was going to do that. And this is the weird thing, and this is what got me really thinking about it, is why, uh, why would you feel better after finding out that your partner was going to sell the engagement ring? I mean, like, surely you would just be angry and feel betrayed, but uh, uh, not necessarily. The reason, the reason I think is uh, is rather in depth, and uh, what I'm going to do is actually going to apply an economic model, and hence the economics of love. Uh, now, for those not familiar with economics, you may not have heard of this, but there's a there's a model called the prisoner's dilemma, and the prisoner's dilemma can be phrased in a couple of different ways. But one simple phrasing is that suppose you have two prisoners, uh, one prisoner like like both of them probably committed a crime, and what happens is a cop comes in. And he goes, he goes, okay, now listen, he goes, uh, listen, let me try my good, good accent for this. Uh, all right, now listen, listen, uh, I'm, I'm gonna give you a deal. Like, you rat out your friend, and I'll give you, you know, I'll let you walk off scot-free. You get off totally scot-free, scot-free. Your friend, however, is gonna go to jail for nine years. Nine years, if you rat on him. All right, that's the deal I'm gonna offer you. But if you say nothing, you say nothing, I got enough evidence on you, you're going away, you're going away to prison for at least four years. Four years. You want that? No. You want off free. You want off scot free. So you approach both of these prisoners and you say that, you know, like rat on, rat on your friend and, uh, you know, you get off free. But the trick is, if they both rat on each other, they both get nine years. 
So there's a couple of different options. One option is that they both agree to, they cooperate, they say nothing, they both get four years, uh, or they betray each other. And uh, like if one betrays, and if one betrays and the other cooperates, if one swindles and the other cooperates, then the swindler uh, gets off free, and the one that cooperated gets punished. He loses substantially, uh, and of course you get vice versa. And then you've got the mutual betrayal, the mutual swindling. And uh, if both sides betray, then they both get nine years, and uh, both sides lose. So generally, economics describes the optimal pathway is for uh, the two sides to cooperate. And this is seen as there's there's a couple of different ways of looking at it. Like the way that I proposed, you've got a, a, you know a maximum of eight years between them spent, versus the nine years <clears throat> if one swindled the other. Uh, you know, so there's this sort of a net a net uh, a net gain from not swindling each other. But there's other ways of setting this thing up. And another way that you can set this up, in a way that probably makes more sense in context, is that uh, in a relationship, a lot of times you get into stuff with money, where you start to ask yourself, you become very close, and you start, uh, you know, freely exchanging money between one between one another. Like if one of you has to get a car change or whatever, and you're short on cash, then you can call up your partner and be like, "Hey, I'm short on cash. Uh, can you help me with my car?" And maybe they will, and you kind of go back and forth. And you you have sort of a tab in your head. But uh, it's more like an emotional tab, maybe, or at least in my case, it's generally sort of an emotional tab. It's like, how do I feel about lending you money? And uh, if at some point I start to get uh, irritated about lending you money, probably I've been lend lending too much money. So uh, you know, in love, I have an emotional tab, and uh, and yeah. So so you start to you start to get to where you're you're exchanging money interchangeably. Like if one person needs money. Uh, but what this can lead to, though, is a sort of prisoner's dilemma situation like I just described. Uh, like, for example, let's suppose that you and your, your lover move in together to an apartment. And so ideally what you're going to do is you're both, you're both working because that's how things are this day and age unless, you're, unless you have a really nice job and one of you can afford to stay home. But, uh, but presumably you're both working and you're both adding, you know, half of your, you're, you're both paying half of rent, you know, utilities and all that other stuff. And let's say you each have to pay $500. Well. Uh, you know, normally in a good situation, you've got, that's the cooperation aspect, is the both of you are cooperating, you both agree, you don't have to like have a discussion or th anything like that. You just blindly trust that the other person is going to pitch in $500. But there's a possibility that one of you could decide one day that like, you know what, I want a television or I want a trampoline or I want some kind of frivolous item, you know. I'm going to buy something for myself. And when they go out and they do that, what happens is they buy something for themselves and then they don't have enough money to pay rent. And so they turn to you and they say, hey, I'm going to be a little bit short on rent this month. Can you pitch in? And everybody has their foibles. You get these moments every now and then where somebody makes a mistake. Like maybe they don't, they don't predict how much money they have very well and they get themselves into trouble. You do this once and it's kind of forgiven. But some people will do this habitually where they'll go out and they'll just they'll, they'll spend their money on themselves, they'll do this sort of thing, and they know that their partner is going to have to pay rent. Like, you're gonna have to pitch in, you're gonna have to pay rent. Uh, which is why I've seen a joke once. Somebody was like, somebody's like, you know what, like, I don't want a woman, because I don't want a woman who, like, likes the same music as me or who watches the same shows and all that. No, no, that's not important. What I want is a woman who I can sign a lease with. Because uh, it's, it's a joke because if you can trust someone with a lease, then it's actually a very strong component of, of a relationship. Uh, like following this prisoner's dilemma, like I say, uh, you look at like the cooperation element is you both pay pay rent, and then you got your swindling element. One of you pays rent and the other doesn't, and uh, so the person who's not paying rent benefits, like they're getting out of prison free, whereas they land you in the slammer for nine years. But then you've got the mutual loss scenario where one person can be like, oh, hey, I'm not going to pay rent. And then you get angry and you say, well, I'm not going to pay rent either. Like, I'm not going to throw in my half of the, I'm not going to throw in another half of the rent. I can't keep doing this. And then you get yourselves both evicted. And uh, I'm not sure if there's an advantage there. There may be. I believe it would obliterate both your credit histories and you would both be out of a place to stay. And uh, interviews with a new place to stay might find you a little bit, uh, they might be a little weary about you. But on the bright side, I mean, I don't know, maybe the courts would assign your debts to either of you. And, uh, and so you're both mutually screwed, but uh, hey, at least the other person suffers. Uh, and yeah, so this comes back to like in a relationship, in love, you have people always uh, put a lot of emphasis on like trust and compromise and communication and things like that. And uh, that's because all of this stuff actually kind of falls back into this sort of prisoner's dilemma sort of thing. And this simplified model, it applies very well to so many different things. Uh, another thing that I've gotten into, and, and of course not with Kenza because I never lived with her or my, my previous previous fiance, but I did live with another girlfriend. And one thing that she used to do is she used to scold me for not doing the dishes. And uh, and post-relationship, this, this actually 
cracks me up. Like in hindsight, this cracks me up. But she used to get on my case for not for not doing the dishes. She'd be like, Greg, you know, like how come you're not doing the dishes? Like every single week, the whole like the sink stacks up, and you never come out here and you take care of it. You're so lazy. You're making such a mess. And I was like, oh, it's, I'm sorry, dear. All right, look, I'll go out and I'll clean the dishes. And I would go clean the dishes. And this is how she got me motivated to clean the dishes all the time. And uh, and when she moved out, like when we when we split up and she moved out. Um, like, it turned out that I was actually the clean one. Because after that, like, the apartment was clean all the time. The dishes didn't stack up. Everything was fine. It was, like, it was a little bit baffling at first. I was just like, man, like, it seems like the sink is empty all the time. I never have to come out here and clean it. And, uh, and then, like, you know, a month or so later, that girl, she contacted me again. She's like, hey, like, let's, let's just talk and catch up for a little while. Like, do you maybe want to come over and, and I'll, I'll prepare dinner? And uh, let's just, you know, reminisce about old times. Because you get in that, you get sucked back into your old, your old relationships. Uh, very bad habit, I don't recommend it. But, uh, but anyway though, so I agreed to do that. And when I came out to see her, uh, what she had done is she'd, she'd, she'd used up all of her dishes. Like all of her pots and pans, everything. She'd used it all, and it was all just sitting in the sink. And she goes, yeah, before I start cooking dinner, I'm gonna need a little bit of help cleaning the dishes. So uh, that was like, she called me over one last time to take care of her dishes for her. And, uh, and so yeah, so I came over and I cleaned her dishes and in exchange, she bought and cooked dinner. So uh, yes, dishes is another one of these things, like these kind of like daily chores that you get into if you live with, your, if you live with somebody. Uh, this is not just with romantic partners, this is with roommates and everything else. But, uh, uh, but like with dishes, you presume that the other person is going to clean their half of the dishes. Like a lot of people, if you move in, you're in a roommate situation. You you may not set up like a specific agreement. You just uh, have dishes and for example, like if I use a dish, then I'll go and I'll clean it. Like I, I try to keep track of what I use and I don't stack stuff up in the sink. But, uh, but if your roommate uses dishes and then never ever cleans the dishes, then eventually the sink is just gonna fill up. And then you won't be able to use the sink, like you get this sort of arms race of laziness as you wait to see like who can tolerate the mess the longest, like who will get upset that the trash is full first and then take out the trash. And whoever has the lowest threshold for mess will eventually blink and go and take care of things. But it's the prisoner's dilemma again, where you've got like, uh, we could both mutually agree to clean our own dishes and uh, over the long run, this creates the least amount of stress for uh, like, 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 you know, like you, you take care of your half of the stress and I take care of my half of the stress. And overall, this is like a good situation, but it's kind of an equal split. Uh, or, or you swindle and one of you doesn't do dishes and the other does always do dishes. And then the person who doesn't do dishes saves a bunch of time and energy. And the person who does do dishes is just forced to always like, you know, be your maid. And, uh, and that's a swindling and that's very frustrating for the person who's getting swindled. Uh, or you could try to go for the mutual loss where you just refuse to do dishes and then like uh, several months later you you find you're like looking for a knife and you find it's been rusting in the sink for like you know several months or whatever and uh, and so there you go you have a mutual loss you've got to throw out those knives you got to throw out whatever 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 stuff you've got it's ruined by like mold and decay and rust and things like that mutual loss mutual loss you hold out for the mutual loss because you don't want to be you don't want to be swindled it's a it's a pride thing so uh, there is a way though that you can overcome this sort of situation and it's communication. The prisoner's dilemma is only a dilemma because the two guys in prison, uh, the two prisoners can't conceivably sit down and agree ahead of time what they're gonna do. And a lot of times this economic model is applied to uh, uh, like pricing and things like that. Like you say like two companies have a certain price for a widget that they're selling. Like they've got these widgets and so like they both sell this widget for $20. And if they continue to sell the widgets for twenty dollars, then that's mutually cooperative, and they both benefit. But if one of them lowers their prices, then the widget seller who's selling stuff for more uh, loses customers, and they lose profits, and it hurts them. So uh, the the widget seller who's losing can then their option is to lower prices to match the other guy, and then both widget sellers lose because they both lowered their prices to compete with each other, and and they've lost. Uh, you know, so you get that you get that same deal where like one company kind of screws the other by lowering prices, or they can both quietly keep things right where they are and be happy with the profits that they have. Uh, you find that with oligopolies, uh, most frequently, like an oligopoly is when uh, is when there's only a very few competitors. Like you have like maybe two competitors, like say with with computers or whatever you have. Like you have like Apple and you have PC, and uh, if they're both selling you know their OS, then you might find that they both sell their OS at the same price, and uh, and they don't have to lower prices. They don't have to compete. 
because there's only like one other person that's actually selling an OS that anybody buys, and uh, and you wind up in the situation where both companies know they're, they're like, yeah, I mean, like if I lower my prices, they'll lower their prices, but if I just leave them where they are, they won't do anything. So you know, maybe they don't compete. Uh, of course, Apple and PC do compete on some levels, but uh, uh, you know, oligopolies are a little bit dangerous for that reason. They're not they're not perfectly trustworthy, but they can be. But uh, if your prisoners are allowed to communicate, though. Like, if you take these two guys and you sit them down, they say, all right, look, this is what the cop put on the table. He says that if I rat you out, you know, uh, you'll get nine years, but I'll get off free. And so then they can discuss and they can make a deal. And like one of them, maybe, maybe, maybe one of them has more status than the other one. Like maybe one of them's a boss and the other one's just a crony. And so the boss says, all right, look, all right, look, Jimmy, Jimmy, if you go ahead and you, you take this hit, you take this fall and I get to walk off scot-free, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pay for your child's college fund education or something like that. He get out the hood or he get out the, uh, the, he get out the whatever, whatever accent I'm applying. He get out of that. He get out of the Kentucky fried chicken. He never have to work in Kentucky fried chicken again. And, uh, and you know, so, so like, um, yeah. So you make a deal, you strike up an agreement and, uh, and in this way you kind of can get your swindling, but the other person is still getting something, uh, in return. Or there might be some kind of deal, like you might even say, like, you take this hit for me, and then later on something else will come down the road for you. Like, you know, we're just going to see. Like, you have to trust me. So you can get into sort of a prisoner's dilemma within a prisoner's dilemma. And this actually probably happens more frequently in relationships than anything, where uh, you agree to sacrifice, and then the other person, you just trust that they're going to come back, and they're going to make an equal sacrifice for you if you ever need it. And of course, you just try not to ever call on that favor, because, uh, you know, major sacrifices are, are a huge strain on your partner. But, uh, but you just assume, you, you assume, you know that, like, they're asking you to make this sacrifice now, but they'll make a sacrifice for you later on down the road. So yeah, so with communication, you're allowed to get yourselves deeper into the prisoner's dilemma, or you're allowed to work through and, and create a viable situation for the both of you. And this is actually why it is illegal for two companies to call each other and to talk about what prices they want to set. Because if all the companies got together and they all agreed, like, hey, we're going to set this price at you know, like the new, the new OS, whatever, we're all going to sell it for $500. And if nobody competes, then we're all going to make a fortune because everybody needs an operating system these days. And uh, so, so, so yeah, it's illegal. It's illegal in business, but, uh, but it's perfectly legal. And in fact, it is the optimal strategy if you are in a relationship with somebody or even if you're just their roommate. Uh, you find that most people, if, they, if you tell them like, yeah, man, like my roommate never does the dishes, most people will tell you, make a job chart. Like that is essentially you sit down, you communicate and you agree to like say like, all right, you do this this week and I'll do this this week. And you trust that they're going to do what they're, what they're assigned to do. And if they don't though, then you know that they've screwed you. It's not just that they're waiting. Like it's not, it's not that they're waiting to check to see if you swindle them or vice versa. Like you're not trying, you're not both betting on a mutual loss. You are, uh, you are, you are supposed to be cooperating. If one of you skips, then they've swindled you and you know they've swindled you and you can go and you can get on their case about it. You can go and you can complain. Uh, so yes. So yes. So you get into that sort of thing. Like, like say, and, uh, and with relationships, like relationships are very vulnerable because like with the roommate, you know, you, you're just worried mostly about like the lease and maybe dishes and like, I don't know, the clean, cleanliness of the bathroom, like who washes the tub or whatever. And, uh, and, and that can be a pain, but if one of you is like not too stressed about cleaning, like you find that sometimes, uh, rather than going through the trouble of like working something out and trying to get on everyone's case and make sure no one's pulling a swindling, that some people just say like, yeah, you know, I mean like the dishes aren't that big of a deal. So, so they just do the dishes, you know, it's, it's fine. They do the dishes. Um, that nah, lost my train of thought. I was going somewhere with this. Um, um. Yeah. Oh, oh, no, yeah. But relationships, though, relationships are a little bit more vulnerable because you're not just putting your your uh, you're not just putting like money on the table or just time. You're also putting like your emotional resources on the table. People are, emp are empathetic. And so, for example, if somebody that, you know, is sad, like and they have a sad face, it makes you feel sad to look at them. And that's even more profound with somebody that you love. If you care deeply about somebody and uh, every time they come over, they look sad. It's going to bring you down. It's going to make you look sad. So if you have a partner, for example, who, who consistently is, you know, using you to bring their day up, like if they're, if they're stressed out all the time and they're sad and, uh, and they constantly need reassurance and help, then like every single day, they're going to make you sad. And, uh, like this is one reason, this is one of the reasons why uh, stress will, will break up a relationship, but I have a slightly more complex financial explanation for this as well. Um, 
Like, it's not just it's not just that a stressed out person will make another person sad and you get that empathetic sadness. That is a big deal. It's taxing on the emotional resources. But even further, you find that when someone is in a situation of, of stress or, uh, or, or where they don't have a lot to put on the table, uh, the prisoner's dilemma kind of kind of works with unequal parts as well. You can get into situations where suppose like suppose that you're going to pay rent and you know that like one of you doesn't have a very good job and the other one has a pretty reasonable job. And uh, and so like uh, uh, you both say that like okay we're gonna both donate five hundred dollars into rent. Well, one of you is barely making ends meet, and the other one is doing okay. Like you you know you could probably afford to pay a little bit more. So if you cooperate, you both spend five hundred dollars. But uh, uh, let's suppose let's suppose like given the prisoner's dilemma situation, let's suppose that if you cooperate, you both get four years. But if, if one person swindles the other, then he gets off uh, scot-free. Like, but, uh, no, no, okay, let's, let's suppose, okay, one person is more guilty than the other. Sorry, let me phrase this a little bit better. One person is more guilty than the other. So if he cooperates, uh, then he goes to prison for like seven years. Uh, if he swindles, he gets off free. Uh, if, he, if he gets swindled, then he goes to prison for nine years. Meanwhile, you've got this other person who's less guilty, and they if they cooperate, they get four years. So you have an unequal situation now, where one person, if they cooperate, one person gets seven years and one person gets four years. You find that there's a much higher uh, inclination to swindle when one person has more to gain from the swindling. Like, you go from seven to zero years, that's a pretty substantial gain from swindling. And of course, if you swindle that person, you know, and the rest of your gang or whatever finds out about that, then they'll shoot you in the back of the head. So there's a certain amount of risk there. It's a great short-term solution, but not a very good long-term solution. But, but still, uh, you look at that short term and you say like, man, like if I cooperate, I'm going to prison for seven. If he rats me out, I'm going to prison for nine. Like that's only a couple more years. Like what's the, whatever, I'm going to rat him out. So they just go for it. Like you go for that much larger gain. And you get that in relationships too, where you find that if one person is really stressed out, uh, much more often, like they feel like they can't put a lot of resources on the table. So instead of like trying to keep track of, of their partner and trying to cheer them up and trying to make things sure things are good, you know, that adds to the stress, that's more responsibility, that's more going on. You'll find them putting like nothing on the table and then just relying on their partner's emotional resources or financial resources if things are if things are not looking up. They may not do the work, they may not do this, they may not do that. You get that exact same situation with the prisoner's dilemma. And so in this way, this is why you find that families that are uh, on hard times economically or, or uh, couples that are under a lot of stress because of work or, or uh, school or other things, you know, financial stress, of course, is another, another one of those deals. Uh, you find that you start to get these sort of unequal deals where uh, cooperation is barely where, is barely better than uh, swindling and so they're much more likely to go for the swindle they'll just say like yeah you know like forget it like it's it's suffering one way or the other like I may as well just get a big advantage by cheating now and then uh, and then reap the rewards so uh, so you get that you find that you find that you know uh, in economics and also and also just between relationships you find that that this this is sort of a pitfall of like one of your partners if one partner is really stressed maybe the other's not so stressed then you you wind up with this sort of uh, you can wind up with this tension where one of you is one of you is going to swindle the other. Uh, but the thing is, what you find, and this is sort of interesting, they've done studies with like robots, for example, where they have them do programs where these robots will do the prisoner's dilemma, like they interact with each other and they'll do them over and over again. And in the short run, they find that the robots that cheat the other robots, the swindler bots, as we'll call them, the swindler bots, uh, they actually do really well initially on all the first trials. Because uh, uh, a lot of the robots, like some of the robots kind of pitch their stuff out there and they try to trust, like they try to trust the other robots, and, uh, and they get screwed. And so these, uh, these swindler bots, they reap all these major rewards really early on, they get really big early on. And, uh, and of course, this isn't like society, so instead of becoming the top 1% and they own all the money, uh, you know, they just have whatever, whatever reward is established at the beginning. Uh, but then as it goes on, as these sort of like prisoner dilemma things go on and all the computers are interacting with each other and they're communicating and they're logging who swindled and who didn't, uh, you find that the computers that, that do most successfully are the ones that cooperate with cooperative computers and swindle swindling computers. So uh, like the swindling, because what the swindling does is it prevents the other computers from gaining an advantage, any further advantage. Like it prevents them from gaining any more points. They just lose over and over again. So you cooperate with the cooperative, you swindle the swindlers, and, uh, and in this way, 
you know, you don't you don't wind up putting out a bunch of resources for nothing. You don't let swindlers get to the top of the pile and then just screw everybody else. And people function must much the same way. Uh, we do let swindlers get to the top of the pile, unfortunately, because swindlers are able to write laws that protect the their ability to swindle. And as much as we'd like to do something about them, you find that like, oh, it was legal that I screwed you, and uh, you can't do anything about it. But on daily personal interactions, though, I mean, like, if you find that you have a person that you know, uh, like I say, like, if your roommate, if you moved in with a roommate, and, like, on month two, they stop paying rent, uh, you might cover them for, like, a few months, but, uh, but sooner or later, like, you would start to get mad, and you would start feeling inclined to do something, like, you wouldn't want to pay rent for them anymore, you would get angry, because you're putting all these resources out there for no reason, and if you go back to this, like, this very ancient time, when maybe, like, you wouldn't be paying rent, because you wouldn't have currency, but you would be harvesting grain, or something like that, you'd be out there working the fields all day long, if you're working the fields all day long, like if you have a brother and you're you're working the fields and you get all this grain and then your brother is lazy and doesn't do anything, he's just laying out there, you know, letting you do all the work and then he eats all your grain, the guy's a huge drain on you. Like he's he's wasting your resources, like you put all this time and energy into providing this food and then you can barely feed yourself and your family because your brother is eating all the grain without doing any, any of the work. So uh, essentially what you have to start doing is you have to stop, you have to stop feeding your brother uh, or you just, uh, uh, you know, acknowledge that there's no food. You're just like, your brother's like, where's the food? And you're just like, there's no food. You ate it all, you jackass. Or you could stop, you could stop working. You could stop putting as many resources in and, uh, just let yourself both starve. But, uh, but generally though, what people will go to is they try to throw those people out of their life. You don't really go for the starving option. You just go to like, uh, all right, get out of my life. And, uh, and you deal with the fallout and the aftermath of, of swindling the other person. So they swindle you and you swindle them back in a in a slightly different way like there's still a swindling occurring but uh, but you swindle them out of the resources that they're trying to take from you and, you know like well you you know you shut them out of your life or you throw them whatever you were getting out of them you decide that you're not going to get it anymore um like i don't know like i don't know what your brother was providing like some kind of familial you know it made you look good because you were looking after him or something like that whatever it is you take that hit to your reputation uh or you you take that hit like i don't know your mom will never talk to you again you just take that hit you take that hit and you throw your brother out so, uh, so yeah, so you, you pull a mutual swindling and you both kind of lose in some way. But, uh, but because your, your swindler was swindling you, you know, left and right for far more than you, were, you could tolerate, uh, in the long run, it's better for you. And you cooperate with somebody else. Like you find like your son, like your other brother is willing to work. And so you cooperate with your other brother and, uh, and the two of you succeed and you prosper together. Uh, so you find in relationships though, you get into this same sort of deal where uh, if one person starts emotionally swindling you, like if you find that, that they start to use you just to perk themselves up every day, like if all the time, like, like if your partner is stressed out and they never, you know, like they, they stop worrying about you emotionally and they start using you like as a, as a toilet to just dump their bad feelings on, um, eventually you develop sort of an emotional aversion to, to your partner. And same goes like if they're taking your money, you know, if you find that like they they always need financial help, like they're buying themselves crap, like they buy themselves a brand new computer and then be like, oh, I can't afford money for this mutual relationship thing. Uh, another thing I've seen coming back to that, that sharing money deal is like uh, an argument that I've seen, and this is interesting uh, because it illustrates the issue with communication, is... Um, is for example, like suppose that one of you wants to buy a new computer and it's like some super expensive computer. But then of course, if you buy this computer, you're not gonna have enough money to afford your rent or whatever. So you buy this computer, you force your partner to, to pay for rent. And then you, of course your partner's very frustrated. Like, why did you buy this computer? And normally what you do, if you're in a healthy relationship, you would sit down and you would talk to your partner and say like, look, I wanna buy this computer and these are the reasons why I need it. Like, you know, it's a financial investment. I work for my computer and so I need a good expensive computer. And your partner might say like, well, I don't know, why don't you get like a slightly less expensive computer? Like it's still got similar specs, but it's a little bit, it's a lower tier on the market. Da, 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 da. And you would have a back and forth and you would agree like these are the sacrifices we're both gonna make and we're both gonna be happy. You've, this is, again, how you defeat the prisoner's dilemma is by having a communication and you, you, you work things out. That's why communication, they say, is key in a relationship. Uh, but what will happen sometimes in a relationship is like one person will, will turn around and they'll make an emotional argument or they'll make a moral argument, you know, and they'll say like, uh, well, I deserve this because you did that. 
you know, uh, which which is kind of like your moral argument, like this is a tit for tat, like you owe me, so I get to do what I want. I get to do what I want, I get to swindle you. Uh, or they say like, uh, uh, you know, like, ah, you don't understand, like I just need the best equipment to do the best of the did. And they break down into tears. And you know, you can't have a conversation with them anymore because they're crying, they're just being emotional. There's nothing you can do. They essentially stonewall you out of communication. And once they stonewall you, I mean, it's, it's essentially sending the message that they're going to screw you one way or the other. Like as soon as they stop communicating, you kind of know, like, all right, they're going to waste their money and they're going to force me to pay for rent. Like, there's nothing I can do. I can't negotiate with them. This is what they're going to do. But at least they're projecting that they're going to swindle you. And uh, because you love them, you feel empathetic towards them. And you say, like, well, you know, I'll take this sacrifice and I'm sure they'll, they'll, they'll come back to me later in time. Uh, you know, until, unless, until they start doing the same thing over and over again, in which case you start to realize, like, they are never going to come back to me, they are never going to provide anything positive, they are just going to keep draining me of my, of my money and resources and everything else like that. Uh, so yes, so, so stonewalling people out of a, out of a discussion, uh, relying on emotional arguments, relying on moral arguments, going for those sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, messing with people's uh, empathy, is a great way to make a gain in the short run by essentially playing the swindler in the in the prisoner's dilemma and uh, and this is interesting because like i say i've seen a lot of people who do this like i've known people and this is their this is their go-to tactic for uh negotiation is they go straight to uh, like woe is me you know my needs are greater like you don't understand the ethical implications like i need this you know yeah, da, 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 da. and they do that and they do that all the time like it's every single thing and, and you find that they're surrounded by people who are tired of them. Like, people who just don't want to take them places and don't want to do things with them. Because if you go out to dinner and everyone's like, all right, like, let's all chip in for the tab. Then they'll say, like, oh, I forgot my wallet. And then everyone's like, oh, okay, you, well, you got to pay. And then they'll be like, no, you don't understand. I'm on hard times and I can't afford me. And then my dad and I didn't do this. And it's like, you, you know, they should have known. They should not have come to dinner in the first place. They should have been up front with everybody about this. But they always have some kind of ethical reason. Always some kind of emotional reason why it's cool for them to swindle everybody. Lots of short-term games short-term gains but uh, but everyone who starts to figure them out like you stop going to dinner with that guy you stop inviting them out to dinner uh, you know you stop providing stuff for them you eventually just start shutting them out of everything because they are long-term bad for you uh, yes so in a relationship though you you find that because the optimal strategy is to start swindling back when somebody swindles you all the time uh, that, that inevitably what kills the relationship, what sends it into a downward spiral, is finally once one person does enough swindling, the other starts swindling as well. And then you get into situations where you are both losing all the time. Like every single day, like every time you have a discussion, you know, like every time you talk about money, every time you do this, every time you do that, one person says like, I want to do this and their plan is to swindle the other person, and the other person says, I, you know, no, I'm gonna do this, and their plan is to swindle the other person. Because uh, if they, if, cause, cause they both know that if one of them puts a risk on the table, a sacrifice on the table, the other person is just gonna take it, and they're gonna benefit, and they're gonna put nothing back. So they start mutually swindling. And this is why you know, this is why like, at the end of every relationship, generally you find it's like, well, are you both doing stuff wrong? Like, are you both being, are you both being irresponsible? Are you both hurting each other? And most of the time, the answer is yes. Because, uh, because by the end of a relationship, as things start to go downhill, you fall into that pattern of mutual swindling. Because it becomes the optimal strategy for your relationship. Because you both, you don't trust each other anymore. You don't communicate anymore. Uh, you don't compromise anymore. So, uh, so yeah, so the prisoner's dilemma thing, it applies to all that, the trust, communication, the compromise. And, uh, and yes. So going back to the whole concept with the engagement ring, uh, which is what which was what got me thinking about this in the first place, is that the engagement ring it's a very it's a very silly tradition in a lot of ways in a pragmatic sense. Like if you think about it, like you go and you buy this diamond and the diamond is worthless, and like I know it's worthless. Like when I bought the ring, I knew it was not really worth the money that they were charging me. Like I looked at it and they were like, yeah, this is gonna be like expensive, and I was like. <laughs> Great, you know, I mean, like, the price means nothing. You, you just slap a number on there and you know I'm going to pay it. So they're, they're like, yeah, I mean, I mean, like, do you want to pay it or not? Like, if you don't give it, if you don't give the girl the ring, you know, like, her friends are going to give her a ring. And so you're, you know, what are you, you going to do, bud? What are you going to do? And uh, so you buy the ring. You buy the ring. And uh, people do it, I think. They were persuaded into being able to do this because when you buy an engagement ring, uh, 
In some ways, it's kind of like a forfeiture. Like you look at it and you say, like, all right, if things go south, then you can sell the ring. And now, you know, this is my symbol of trust. But, but moreover than that, it's like a symbol of sacrifice. It's like showing, like, I'm willing to occasionally put up with your foibles and accept that you're going to make mistakes. Like, sometimes you're going to need money. Sometimes you're going to need support. Like, you may break a leg. You may, you may get sick. You know, like, I am going to put up with the sacrifice and I'm going to sacrifice for you. Like, this ring cost me, like, you know, two, two weeks, two weeks, like, not two weeks, uh, two, two months, two months, two months what I earned. Like, this, this cost me a lot of money, this ring. This is so, so expensive. You have no idea, no idea. And so you buy this girl, like, this super expensive ring, just like, yeah, two months, two months I had to put into this. It's proof, it's proof that I would do this crap for you. <laughs> like, so, so this is kind of the message that you're sending is that uh, I'm willing to sacrifice for you. Like, I'm willing to, to, like, every time we face these prisoner dilemmas, which are gonna happen over and over and over again throughout the relationship, every time we do this, I am willing to make the sacrifice if I have to. And, and, uh, and this is kind of, it's a symbol of trust. It's like showing that you're, you're willing to play that game and you're willing to do that sort of thing. And, uh, and in a way, too, it's, it's also putting something on the table for the woman. She takes it and she agrees not to go sell it. Because you give her the thing, like you give her the thing and you say like here, you know, like this is this is money on the table, right? Like I'm putting this here, don't run off and go sell it somewhere. And so she takes it and she goes, yeah, no, I'll treasure this and I'll wear it. And you know, I'm, I'll agree not to mess around with any other guys and I'll do this. Like I'm, I'm saving myself for you. Like, so these are, these are kind of the things that you're sort of giving. You give this, you give this frivolously expensive ring and she agrees, you know, all right, I'll keep it. And I'm not gonna like see other people. Like we're exclusive now, we're gonna get married. Uh, potentially I'm going to get pregnant, that's going to be a great big, you know, drain on the both of us, and da, 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 da. So, so you've got kind of a mutual thing. But then when the relationship ends, uh, that's kind of when, like, the bets are off. And this is at the end, you think, like, both people have been swindling each other towards the end of the relationship. Like, however they're doing it, whether it's emotionally or financially, whatever sort of stress, whatever kind of tension between them, uh, is going on. Usually there's some sort of swindling going on. It's something with the prisoners. It's, it's, it's related to the prisoner's dilemma. There's other stuff, more complicated stuff that doesn't fit into the model, but uh, the prisoner's dilemma is a part of it. So you get to the end of the relationship and you've got this engagement and the woman's got the ring. And, and at this point, like this is kind of where the trust comes in, where it's like, all right, when I put this on the table, we had this prisoner's dilemma. There was an unspoken agreement <laughs> that I would give you this ring and it's like a show of my, my willingness to sacrifice. And you hang on to it, and, and it, like you're accepting that I'm willing to sacrifice, but you're, you're not gonna make me sacrifice because there's love between us, you know? So, uh, you find that as a display of courtesy, a display of courtesy, if, a, if an engagement doesn't work out, if the woman wants to be courteous, she gives the ring back. But she is allowed to sell it, is the thing. She's allowed to take it as a forfeiture and just say, you know what, like, I'm just, I'm just gonna take the cash. I'm gonna, like, take this $2,000 ring and I'm gonna sell it for $100. And it's kind of, it sends a lot of messages. Like, it's symbolic in a lot of complex ways. You know, part of it is, part of it, like, a really big part of it is just kind of like an up yours, you know, to the guy. It's like saying, like, I hate you. Like, I, I hate you. Like, I wish you were dead. You know, because it's such a, it's like you take this just ludicrously expensive item that's not really worth the money and you just, you sell it for like scraps. You sell it for, you know, pocket cash. Like you could, you could work for a couple hours. The amount of time that you spend looking for a pawn shop that will give you a fair deal on an engagement ring could, could uh, potentially be used to like just work nine to five or whatever, you know, like, like, I mean, maybe not for like a hundred dollars or whatever, but it's, you know, you go out of your way, you go sell the ring. It's, it's sends a lot of messages. And, uh, and for me, what I got to thinking about was that at the end of that relationship, you've got that sort of deal where you're just swindling back and forth. And like, I was just sitting there when, when I split up with Kenza, one of the things that was going through my head is just like, man, I am getting screwed. Like I'm getting screwed all the time. And, uh, and I, I don't think that I can keep this going anymore. Um, like, I mean, like I, you look at, you look at the long distance relationship thing and what was put on the table. And this was, this was a little bit util, unilateral. In fact, um, was, the plan became, uh, after communication quit, like there, this, this was a little frustrating, but communication stopped and then the plan became, without my input, that I was going to like split rent and then uh, live in Denmark 
for three months at a time because that was how long I could legally live there. And I was going to have to buy the plane ticket to fly out there all the time. And I was going to have to learn Danish. And I was going to have to accept that I wasn't going to be able to drive while I was out there. And like Denmark wasn't going to provide any kind of social security for me. So their medical system was, was like not really off the limits. But if I had to go to the hospital or see a doctor or whatever, I was going to have to pay for it out of pocket. Because like American insurance, that's not, like Denmark is not in the network in the American insurance. Thing. Uh, I was going to have to give up bacon. Like... You know, like there was a lot, there was a lot that was going on. I mean, like I wasn't going to have to give up bacon, but essentially if I was going to start living with Ken, like Kenza doesn't eat bacon, so I wasn't going to be able to go out and buy bacon. Like there were so many things on the table, like so many sacrifices, so much going on, like financially, uh, emotionally, like it was just going to be, it was going to be a lot. And so, you know, I was just looking at all these, all these sacrifices I was going to have to make that were being proposed and, uh, and just looking at how frequently I was being screwed on on sort of like emotional exchanges and and financial things and and uh, and and uh, I tried to talk about it and uh, and I got stonewalled with the emotional thing like it was like a, a, it, it, there were tears and a communication couldn't be had and uh, and going back to that thing where I say like if somebody if somebody approaches a communication like if they you get out of the prisoner's dilemma by having a talk, by interacting with the other person and saying like, all right, look, this is how things are, and this is what we need to sacrifice, and this is what we're doing, and if you provide me this, then I'll provide that. Uh, that's how you get out of the prisoner's dilemma. That's how you get into a mutual beneficial, mutually beneficial situation, and you can essentially both get what you want, you know. Uh, but, but yeah, but the discussion, uh, it went south because it went straight to emotional stuff and like ethical arguments and emotional arguments, and, uh, and then, and then it, it came to a bluff. And it was, uh, you can take what I'm offering or you can walk, essentially was what it was. Uh, she said, so you can, you can make these sacrifices and you can be happy with what I may or may not give you, or you can leave. Uh, so I had to go. And, uh, and like I say, uh, spent, spent several weeks uh, drinking myself stupid and, uh, and wondering if I made the right choice. But when I emailed, when I emailed my, my ex-fiance about the ring, and she told me that she was going to sell it, uh, it was like that was that final swindling on the on the whole thing. Like it was like, uh, yeah, like are you gonna are you gonna return the ring? Like like we we tried to sort of split up on somewhat courteous terms. Like are you going to return the engagement ring? And when the guy leaves, like you're, a woman is often considered even less obligated to return the ring. Like I say, it's a pure, it's purely a courtesy to do so. And uh, and she told me, you know, no, up yours, buddy. I'm gonna sell the thing. So. Uh, in a way, it provided this very profound, this very profound sense of closure. Like I looked at that, and uh, I had predicted it. Not only had I predicted it, but I'd also predicted the the uh, justification for it that I was going to receive. And uh, in a lot of ways, it provided this this sense of closure because I'd been swindled one last time. Like I just kind of looked at that, and I was like, "Yeah, she ran off with the ring. That's uh, that's that." Like, that's it. That's a wrap. Like, it's all over. Uh, it was probably for the best to end it. Like, uh, uh, sad to say, unfortunate, it didn't work out. But I don't know. Like, that's how you know. That's, that's I think, that when you've gone through and you're both, you're both at that point where, where neither of you can agree to cooperate, you can't agree to communicate, uh, you, you can't play the dilemma, uh, the prisoner's dilemma correctly anymore. Um, you know, when you finally, when you finally get in touch with her and she's selling the engagement ring, that's when you just know that you were never gonna, you were never gonna fix it. Like, one of you was gonna continue, at least one of you was gonna continue to get swindled nonstop. And even, even if you got back together, the swindling was gonna continue. The problem was going to maintain. Uh, the relationship was over. So, uh, you know, that's how it is. That's why trust, communication, and compromise are so important. It's not just because uh, you know you need to be able to do these things, but also just from an economic standpoint, from a, from a way to form optimal long-term communication with people. Like I know that that this is said frequently, but uh, I don't know. To me, to me, like when you look at it from a very structured perspective, uh, from the point of like a model, like a and a, and a fairly a fairly cohesive model. Uh, I don't know. It just makes a lot of it makes a lot of sense, and. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It was a thing that was on my mind, and so I thought I would do a thing on it. And uh, I don't know. For those young folks out there who are kind of looking around and they're they're looking maybe to get more serious, it's something to think about. Uh, in my opinion, I think, like I say, we all make mistakes, and sometimes you need your partner to bail you out on things. It, it happens. It comes up. 
But I think that if you're you're going to date, uh, as a rule, if you're going to swindle someone, try to swindle them once and by leaving. Because if you if you get in the habit of swindling someone, if you get to where you're constantly reaping a reward by swindling, by by uh, taking more than you put forward, or or taking taking without putting anything forward. I mean, you know, like I say, you get these unequal things, and usually your partner will understand. Like if you can't put forward stuff, if you can't put forward enough, and you're upfront about that, and you tell them, and you say like, I can't provide anymore, but I really appreciate what you're doing. Usually. That emotional validation also has value. Like people care, people care, people are empathetic. So, so emotional validation has weight. Like you can, you can need help, you can need emotional support. But, but just, just thank your partner once in a while. Just say, you know, thanks for being there. Don't treat it like it's a job. Uh, this, this is one thing. That's right. This is one of the things that I was going to talk about. Is um, online now uh, it's very easy to find people who will agree with you especially if you're in a situation that you really want support on like if you're in a bad spot in your relationship uh it, it, many people find it very tempting to want to look at it and say like you know emotionally i'm right like like they're doing something wrong and emotionally i'm right and uh, and i think the fact is is that like once you both get into that mutual swindling thing you both feel like you're in the right you're both swindling each other because you're mad at them you can't trust them anymore and so on and so forth but the truth is you're both wrong uh, you, you've been wrong, like it was wrong, like, and if you can't stop swindling because you can't trust them anymore, the relationship has to end because you're both wrong, because you, you're not doing anything good, you're always wrong. But I see this though online, where, where people get out there and they say like, you know, you have a responsibility to yourself. And they say that, you know, like, your partner has a responsibility to you, and you have a responsibility to yourself. And uh, these sorts of sentiments, uh, like, like, it's especially popular on Tumblr. People love this on Tumblr because it's like telling you, you're right. You're always right. Like, if they don't agree with you, they're wrong because they have an obligation to you. And you have an obligation to yourself. Uh, but it's so childish. It is so beyond reprehensible. I mean, that mindset, essentially what they're saying is you should swindle your partner because you deserve it. Like, you are the most important. And, uh, and you will never, you'll never have a long-term relationship with that mindset. You always have an obligation with your partner, of course. You always need to be willing to sacrifice with them. You need to cooperate. Like, if you both find yourself about to go to prison and a cop says, hey, if you both keep quiet, you'll only get four years, then keep quiet and trust that your partner is going to keep quiet too. If they swindle you, if you find yourself in prison for nine years, then I guess you had better leave them because then maybe they'll do that twice. But, but presumably... What makes a good relationship is the situation where you both go to prison for four years. Yeah, yeah. you can quote me on that one. Uh, this, yes, yes, anyway. So no, no, yeah, the, 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 the longest running relationship though is gonna be one where you're both making compromises and you're both putting stuff on the table. If you can't provide enough uh, financially, if you can't provide enough uh, you know, emotionally, just try, try to meet obligations, be honest. Talk, talk to your partner. Always tell them like, why is it that you can't do something if you can't do it and and try not to, to put them in a situation too often if you can avoid it and just just appreciate just appreciate don't assume that they're required to do it don't take it for granted don't don't act like it's their job because it's not their job it's a prisoner's dilemma it's an economic model it's like econ 101 uh, if you're swindling someone if you're screwing them all the time inevitably their optimal course of option will be to start screwing you so don't start screwing your partner and, uh, uh, yeah. So anyway, that's it for today, I suppose. Thanks for joining me, everybody. I will catch you all next time.